This is the Andy Social Podcast. My name is Andy Dowling. And before we kick into this week's episode, before I introduce this week's guest, I thought I would stop momentarily to welcome all the new people listening to the Andy Social Podcast. So this is if this is your first time listening to the podcast, thank you so much and a big welcome. And I really hope that this episode will be the starting point of a long relationship together that you'll continue to listen into the future and go back and listen to some of the previous 100 plus episodes that uh, that I've put out over the last couple of years. Lots of different people, lots of uh, interesting conversations and stories and, and things to learn. And as you will see, this is this episode's a great example of me asking a lot of dumb questions, being completely out of my depth, and not knowing what the hell I'm talking about. However, I somehow managed to scrape it all together and come out with a great conversation with an amazing person. So, segue, this week's guest is with Professor Tamara Davis, and Tamara is a astrophysicist. Um, and a cosmologist, and I'm going to, because look, let me let me just stop for a moment. Previous episodes, and for people that have been listening to this podcast for a long period of time, know that I make an attempt to try and explain who my guest is and what they do, and I often butcher it up, or at least I feel that I do anyway. And the guest usually explains themselves far better. But what I thought I'd do is. Uh, Tamara's uh, working over at the University of Queensland in the School of Mathematics and Physics, and I went to the website to her profile page, which will be in the show notes over at andysocial.net, so you can uh, you can fact check this. But I thought I'd just read out the bio that's on there and stumble through that rather than me make an attempt to interpret it in my own words, which usually just sounds really unintelligent. So very quickly, uh, Professor Tamara Davis is a cosmologist interested in investigating new fundamental physics, such as the properties of dark energy and dark matter and the mass of the neutrino. Ooh. A winner of the 2011 Australian Institute of Physics Women in Physics Lectureship, the 2011 Queensland Tall Poppy Award, the 2009 Australian L'Oreal Women in Science Fellowship, and the Astronomical Society of Australia's Early Career Research Award. Oh, what a mouthful. Professor Davis joined the astro astrophysicist team at UQ to work on the Wiggles Dark Energy Survey, which was which has mapped so far 220,000 galaxies across half of the observ observable universe. I told you I'm going to stumble through this, guys. She and the Wiggles team are using that data to test our theory of gravity and to try and figure out the nature of dark energy and dark matter. Pretty heavy stuff, right? Yeah. When I first read that, I thought, do I really want to talk to this person? Because I've got no idea what the hell that any of that stuff is and uh, whether I'm just, this is going to be a waste of uh, Tamara's time as well as mine. But you know what? I pressed forward and Tamara's got some amazing videos. She's done TEDx talks. Um, there's some really, really cool stuff online. Lots of great content. And I'm going to have it all in the show notes over at andysocial.net. So once I looked at all this stuff, I knew that uh, Tamara definitely needed to be on the podcast. And we made a couple of attempts over the last se several months to uh, meet up and have a conversation. And it finally happened a few weeks ago. I caught up with Tamara at her apartment in West End in Brisbane. And we sat down for about an hour and just had a, had a chat. And I asked a lot of dumb questions. So for you guys that are heavy into this uh, field of work and know a lot about uh, about dark energy, dark matter, uh, cosmology, um, you know, astrophysicist work, you know, all that sort of stuff, then you're going to probably cringe and, uh, and suffer through this episode. But if you're like me, I reckon you'll find this really entertaining. So now that I've stumbled through that horrible intro, <laughs> please enjoy this really, really great conversation, trust me, with Professor Tamara Davis. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, good. Yourself. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm in this nice, warm, sunny apartment in West End. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Nice location. Um, well, I'll just dive in. So who are yep. you? What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name's Tamara. I'm an astrophysicist, which is uh, a very entertaining thing to be able to say, but I thoroughly enjoy my job. I, I research cosmology. I study the universe as a whole from its beginning all through its evolution and try and use the natural experiments that go on up in space to understand the physics of the world we live in. Wow. That, uh, it sounds like you said that a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> Variants on that. Yes, yeah. a few times. Um, what's for... 
for uh, from a layman's point of view, what's the difference between because I've, I've seen tidal uh, astrophysicists for yourself, but also cosmologists. What's the difference? Yeah, so the cosmologist refers to universe as a whole, okay. so understanding the like the evolution of the universe, the right. Big Bang, the the birth yep. of the universe, its eventual fate, whereas astrophysics is. Uh, anything up in space, but un usually understanding things like galaxy formation, how did the stars form, how did things evolve. Mm. And so the cosmology in some sense is the really, I think of it as a really fundamental part of astrophysics, where you're really just trying to understand the questions like, where did we come from? How did the universe the, begin? Like the big picture? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then the astrophysics is filling in the details of what goes on in our universe and how do planets form and that kind of thing. Wow. And, um, was there a light bulb moment that made you just think, I'm going to, I'm just going to dive into this and do this? Cause it's such a, it's such a niche thing. <laughs> Absolutely not. In. There was no light bulb moment. I just, um, <laughs> I just, uh, did the next thing that was most interesting in front of me at any point. Like uh, when I was a kid, I, I liked science. I liked maths. I had, um, was fascinated by, uh, I guess space, but I didn't really think hey, I'm going to be an astrophysicist. I just mm. liked science fiction novels and yeah. that kind of thing. And I went to university and studied physics partly because one, it was the most interesting thing I could think of, but also it had lots of options yeah. um, where I could study philosophy and different things during the, the course of that as well. And so, yeah, I went and did that. And then all of a sudden there was a, a project on offer for honors that was like studying expansion of the universe, which sounded pretty cool. Did that and somehow fell into a PhD in astrophysics after that. <laughs> Just sort of all happened. So, yeah. So it wasn't this uh, moment where you sat there and said, I know exactly where, where this is all going. It was just a, a natural progression of just opportunities Following and things Following my up. nose of whatever happened to be most <laughs> interesting directly in front of me at any moment. That's incredible. It's, um, I don't know what it's like these days, but I guess stereotypically from somebody who's not in that world whatsoever, it seems to be, or it seems to have been a male dominated yeah. world is yeah. it still the case now are you are you the exception it is still pretty male dominated particularly yeah. at the high levels yeah uh there's when when you're coming in in on undergrad and stuff yeah. it's relatively even yeah. um, but then once you get to well, i'm a professor now um, yeah. once you get to professor level it's really asymmetric so yeah. you're like talking more like five ten percent female at um at that level it's really interesting. I work at University of Queensland, and that was the first university in Australia to promote a female to professor of physics. Wow. Which I think is really quite exciting. Yeah. But when I was going for my promotion, I was I found out when that happened. It wasn't too long ago. <laughs> and I was I was actually really shocked. I was thinking, oh, it's probably really late, you know, maybe, you know, 1975 or something mm. might have been the first female. Yep. 2000. Oh, really? I was, seriously? That means I'm going to date myself here. My entire undergrad, there yeah. was no female physics professor. That's in incredible. Australia, not just astrophysics, but physics in general. And yeah, and I'm only the second ever at UQ. Wow. Okay. Do you know where where that sits nationally? And like, is there, a, is there an Australian community of people that... Yeah, sort of. We have the... Um, I mean, there's a lot more uh, that sort of broke the floodgates. There's a lot yep. more female physics okay. professors now, but that's pretty, probably typical for most yeah. big departments around Australia. It's... um. Yeah, it's really fascinating because um, I don't even know how I tracked you down. I might have just been uh, doing some uh, Google searches and going, oh, yeah, I think the, the universe would be a really cool topic. And then sort of drilled down from there and then found the, I might have found the UQ website and then found yourself and mm -hmm. then saw your, your video content and everything on your website as well. And um, But I, I think one of the first things, and not that it should ever be an indicator or a factor to, to take in, but I guess where where we've been in the past is straight away I thought, oh, that's really interesting. Like it's it's not a typical stereotypical male mm -hmm. in this, what is perceived as a male dominated yeah. part of the world, as far as, you know, uh, the sciences in general. Yeah. So um, that was one thing that I noticed straight away. I thought, oh, this is really cool. It's different. Yeah, it's great. And I, I like to get out and give as many talks and possible things as possible because I like breaking those stereotypes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have challenges even now? Like, I mean, you've been, been doing it for quite a few years now. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like I've had a blessed run through yep. astrophysics and, and through academia. I've never felt anything but the strongest support from all of my colleagues. Um, occasionally I've been told that that's just because I'm oblivious to slights, but, <laughs> <laughs> but that's not a bad thing. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, um, t taking offense goes both ways. You've got to, yeah. you've got to take offense as well as give offense. So if someone, um, expresses something that's clearly a, uh, sexist point of view, mm. I'm, my response to that is typically, 
oh, that, like in, in my own mind, hmm, that's something that I have to change. So not yeah. like I don't blame them for having that stereotypical point of view. Mm. I just think about it as something. How do I make change that point of view? Uh, and does I mean does that cut into your into your personality as far as um, analyzing and probably more from a data point of view as looking at numbers? I mean physics is not the most easy of subjects to yeah. <laughs> to be well versed in. Is that yeah. sort of I guess there's probably a bit of a link between how you approach those situations with people? Yeah, quite yeah. possibly. And when you're talking about sort of gender biases and that kind of thing, there's uh, it's really useful to have actual data, mm. uh, and it's. And I really, because I haven't felt personally like mm. I had any impediment at all in being a female in academia, it, uh, I w was slow to acknowledge that the biases existed yep. until you see these really dramatic um, studies that mm. show unconscious biases everywhere. You know, if they did these resume studies where if you just put a female name on the resume, then it gets ranked lower mm. than a male name and um, really very convincing statistics on that kind of thing. Yeah. So the biases are out there and there's things that we have to improve, but there's my take home is there's never been a better time to be a female in maths or physics or engineering or that kind of thing it's really people are paying attention to that and it's really improving oh definitely i think just in general the people are a lot more open-minded in in general and i think mm -hmm. people can just see the benefits of yeah. balancing it out and making it easy for everybody to, yeah. to have an opportunity at, at doing whatever the hell they want really and not yeah. uh, not pigeonholing them um so i know that a lot of from what i've, I've read and a lot of your uh, research and focus has been around, uh, I'm going to completely butcher this, but the expansion of the universe, mm -hmm. dark energy. Yes. Is that still a big focus at the moment? So obviously it's not something yeah. that you just do for a couple of months and go, oh, we worked it out. It's going <laughs> oh, yeah. to be a long-term project. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, the dark energy, the discovery of dark energy was a bit of a surprise. So mm. we've got, there's two major dark things out there in the universe. There's dark matter and dark energy. The stuff that makes up you and I, the periodic table, all of the atoms and stuff like that is about probably only 5% of the total stuff that's out there in yeah, the right. universe. Wow. Uh, so, you know, we're just the icing on the cake. If we don't understand the dark parts of the universe, we're missing the entire cake. Uh, so this is the discovery of dark, dark matter has been known about since the 1930s, but dark energy, uh, just quickly, dark yeah. matter holds galaxies together. Okay. It's, it's, it sounds like I'm talking Star Wars. It binds the galaxies together. No, that's together. good. Yeah, that'll, <laughs> that'll work in with my li my listenership, yes. <laughs> and um, it's uh, it was measured by watching the motion of galaxies and seeing that both galaxies moving in clusters of galaxies yeah. and individual galaxies spinning are all moving too fast to be explained by the amount of matter that you can see. Right. Like, you know, if you spin something, if I have a rope above my head with a weight on the end and I spin it around, I know how hard I have to pull to make that spin sort of a horizontal yep. circle. And the, similarly, if the galaxies are spinning, you know how much matter there has to be to gravitationally pull them and hold them together. Yep. And there's just woefully inadequate. If you account the stars, the dust, anything else that we know of mm. that fits in our normal, sort of what we would call normal matter, woefully inadequate mm. can't do it so there's some sort of dark matter out there and it's not just like planets that aren't glowing very intensely or anything like that it's a different type of particle compared to what we have um so that's a big thing the dark energy we only discovered in the 1990s when a couple of teams tried to measure the deceleration of the expansion of the universe yep okay so hubble noticed uh and some others back in 1929 universe is expanding mm whoa, holy cow, this is a big deal because all of a sudden science is saying, yes, the universe had a beginning, it's got a certain age and blah, et cetera, et cetera. Ever since that moment, people have been asking the question, will it expand forever or will it recollapse? Hmm. And this is basically a what goes up must come down question. Yep. Yep. <laughs> if gravity pulls everything together, then we know as the galaxies are moving apart, that should be slowing down. Um, and it's like if I took my keys, threw them in the air, they slow it down, they stop, then, yeah. come back down. Um, but if I if I take my keys and I throw them at 11 kilometers per second, so <laughs> yeah. this is you know after I've gone Decent. to the gym a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, the uh, if in the absence of a ceiling and air resistance, um, those keys will escape out of escape the Earth's gravity and never return. So the, they'll still slow down while they're doing it. Gravity's mm. still attractive, but they will never come back. So the question was, do galaxies have the escape velocity from each other? Right. Is it going to, is yeah. it, are they going to escape and never return or will they expand and collapse? 
And it was in the 90s where it was actually able to be measured. And shock horror, neither of those scenarios is true. What's happening is the galaxies are accelerating away from each other, Hmm. which is sort of like me taking my keys, gently throwing them up in the air and watching them accelerate off into space. And continue to accelerate. And continue to speed up. Wow. So... Something out there is pushing instead of pulling. And we did, never thought that gravity could push. Like mm. this is some, something out there has some sort of form of anti-gravity effectively. So, yeah, we want to know what, what that is and whether we can harness it. So the idiot in me instantly thinks, well, there must be something on the outside of the universe pulling the universe out and stretching it out. But obviously yeah. we there's, there's nothing outside of what we've yeah. got, the observable in, universe. Yeah. There's, yeah, well, I guess it, it, you might think, well, question, it's hard to tell if there is something outside the observable universe. Like mm. if there's something, there's a certain patch of the universe that we can see, which is determined by how far light can have traveled yeah. in the age of the universe. Yeah. Maybe there's something beyond that that's pulling us out instead mm. of pushing. But it turns out that that doesn't work because you need to pull the entire universe evenly. Like if you measure it in detail, you can't have uh, the the stuff outside wouldn't do the job. Mm. In particular, if you have a sphere, like a spherical shell of mass, so like a a ball that's empty in the center and we're in the center, if that, you'd think that maybe that spherical shell of mass could pull stuff out to it. Yep. That doesn't work because one side of the ball would pull just as hard as the other side of the ball. And so from the inside, you actually, it completely cancels and you don't get any effect at all. So it's... There you go. Scrap that theory. Yeah, so I could have just, I was so on the verge of just (laughs) totally fixing that all and just in solving, solving the uh, the riddle that's been going on for decades. (laughs) Okay. So there's, there's some type of unknown energy Mm -hmm. particles and whatnot that we haven't discovered yet that is pushing Pushing the universe out, but at a, at an increasing rate. Yeah. And it's continuing to increase yeah. from what we can see? Yeah. So as far as we can tell, it initially slowed down. And then um, about 7 billion years ago, it started mm-hmm. to speed up. And it's as far as we can tell, it's going to keep going. Like wow. There's no uh, current theories in, um, suggest that it's just going to keep going and keep uh, expanding, which means the fate of the universe is going to be the big freeze. In other words, as things expand, they can tend to get colder. Yeah. So it'll just run out of... Uh, of energy and um, it, any little space will just get colder and colder and um, we will no longer be able to exist eventually. And I assume that when it gets to a point of that, so if we're looking at our own immediate area, um, we're talking about billions of years before we would have any kind of impact or notice noticeable impact for us. So we, we probably wouldn't even be around by that stage, I'm assuming. Yeah, so the the... Probably the most important thing that we have to worry about at the moment is the sun dying yep. before the universe does anything yep. crazy. Yep. Um, we're also going to crash with and- Andromeda, like our Milky yep. Way. Yep. The whole spiral galaxy of our Milky Way um, is on a collision course with the Andromeda galaxy, mm. which is another big spiral galaxy. And in about 4 billion years, we're going to crash with them. Okay. All right. Yeah, so that's... <laughs> I better start prepping. <laughs> I know. So the, the universe is uh, four and a half... The, no, sorry, the, the Earth is about four and a half billion years old. Okay. So in about the age of the Earth, that's when we're going to crash with another galaxy. That won't necessarily be too disastrous, but it, it's, there's a good chance that um, there'll be some uncomfortable moments. Absolutely. And um, this might not be in any... Um, linked to your research at all but i guess with the fate of of our planet um thinking about things like uh asteroid impacts and mm. things like that i mean that's just probably i don't know does that come into your realm of of research or is that a completely different segment altogether it does actually it's funny because the i haven't talked at all about how we discovered this dark yep. energy and dark matter really um But when we're doing the observations that we do with this, I'm working on this big project called the Dark Energy Survey at the moment. And it's, uh, we basically take, we have a huge wide field camera. It can image an area about 13 times the size of the full moon in one picture. Full, 570 megapixels. Not bad. It's beautiful on on a four meter telescope in Chile. But with that, we can, we, we're doing a survey where we, we're, I'm going to have a survey of about 300 million galaxies and their positions. And... Just while we were observing 300 million galaxies, we just accidentally see everything in the foreground as well, right. which includes 
asteroids yep. and stars in our own galaxy. So with these images, we've got a, a huge international team, like people from six continents, um, who uh, there's over 400 of us, all working on different aspects of this. Some people mm. are looking at the um, at discovering Kuiper Belt objects, which yep. is part of part of our solar system, yep. and looking for asteroids that could potentially destroy Earth and that mm. kind of thing. So it's all it's it's fun because with these these when you look up at the sky the same images contain all sorts of different information yeah. like the distant galaxies the nearby asteroids and we put we all work on our different little bits and pieces of the images. That's amazing. Um, do you? I mean, I guess more in probably pop culture with um, sort of the whole science topic um, becoming a lot more popular in recent years mm -hmm. and um, you know there's people like Neil deGrasse Tyson yeah. and all these guys that are really pushing it to the forefront of people's attention. But there's also an element of that, oh, I guess it's exciting, but you've got to have that fear element of, you know, <laughs> pretend we're on the verge of the end of the world because it only takes one that could come and it could be at this size and it only needs mm -hmm. to be this size that could completely wipe us out and whatnot. Um, is there any reality to that sort of stuff where we have that many close calls with with moving objects that could potentially just uh, <laughs> well, make us go away? There, there is. We don't have that many close calls. Yep. The solar system used to be a much more dangerous place okay. because the way the planets formed was essentially formed out of uh, conglomerations of big space rocks that yep. just hit each other and would eventually get big enough to form a planet. Yeah. And uh, for the first half billion years or so of the um, the Earth's existence, it would have had a molten surface right. because the, it got had so many impacts. So yeah. the rock on the surface of the Earth mm. would have been like lava everywhere. Mm. Uh, so yeah, not so healthy for life. But these days, the the existing planets have done a really good job of sort of vacuuming up the solar system already yeah, right. and okay. getting lots of the rocks um, already Efficient. down. So. There's now we're just left with the sort of the the refuse, the, yep. the last last bits of rock that are still floating around that haven't um, collided with planets yet. Um, but there is a lot of that still out there, mm. and it is completely reasonable to that we could get hit by something. Hmm. And the one of the things that that is a I guess a tiny bit of a worry is the way that we usually discover these asteroids is by looking at their movement across yep. the sky. The stars tend not to move. Um, significantly in the, the galaxies they're always in the same place yep. but because the asteroids are essentially in the foreground of the picture they move sideways as they orbit around in our solar system right. so they move with respect to the stars and yep. so if we see a, an object that wasn't there before and then we see it uh, in another photo quite soon just sort of shifted sideways a little bit then that's there's likely to be an asteroid problem is if an asteroid is heading straight for us it doesn't move in the picture Oh, of course. So, <laughs> eventually it will get bigger, I assume. Yeah, but, eventually it will be. But by that be stage, obvious. it's too late anyway. And um, and we 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 do have the advantage that the Earth orbits the Sun, so it will look different just because we're moving. Yeah. Um, um, and it has to like hit at the right point of the orbit. But yeah, it's not necessarily e easy to actually see the um, part the asteroids that'll hit us, and it requires really big telescopes to scan the sky efficiently, to. Uh, or rather really powerful cameras with wide fields of view to scan the sky efficiently mm. to be able to see these. And it's only recently we've really had technology that can get cl even close to observing enough of the sky to really be give us a warning if this is coming. Wow. Oh, I like to think like all the all the things that we have going wrong in the world and, and all the conflicts that we have amongst each other as, as a yeah. species. And it just seems so trivial in, in comparison to what is beyond you know, yeah. the surface of our planet and yeah. just realizing that it only takes one thing and all this trivial stuff would just be out the window. Yeah, it made a, it, you know, it's a long shot that that's actually gonna happen. Mm. I, I'm not imminently worried about it, but it does give you motivation to improve our space program and go populate other planets yeah. and other, other um, bodies outside the earth because we need to get all of our eggs out of the one basket yeah we're too busy trying to conquer mm -hmm. and dominate our one one little yeah. spot which is so insignificant exactly yeah wow um okay so going back to the dark energy where does the hadron collider fit into this yeah because i believe you've been there i have i got to yeah. visit the large hadron collider That's pretty cool. which is which is very cool i actually was and i was like oh yeah big physics experiment i've seen some of these before but i i actually really got very nerdily excited when i got yeah. down into the tunnels so it was really cool so i've i mean it's obviously been talked about quite a bit over the years since it's been up and up and running mm -hmm. um this thing's huge isn't it yeah so it's a 27 kilometer around ring yeah okay 
Uh, and <laughs> it even spans the border of a country. It goes between Switzerland and France. Wow. It's underneath the ground, so yeah. it, it goes under the border. And uh, they accelerate particles around this to close to the speed of light and then bash them together. And the energy of that collision allows you to make all sorts of different particles, the kind that don't naturally occur very often. Mm. And when you when you create these, you get to test all of the weird, um, weird and wonderful physics of a sort of standard model of particle physics, which goes well beyond things like a, the proton and uh, electron yep. in the atoms. The proton is made up of quarks, which mm. are more fundamental. And so we, you can measure these quarks in the Large Hadron Collider and a whole bunch of other things. So it is the fundamental fundamental thing that it's trying to do is really understand the nuts and bolts of the physics of our universe. The things that we're doing with astrophysics are really similar hmm. in the sense that particularly when you're studying something like cosmology, you're trying to test the laws of gravity. Like we've discovered t types of particles like dark matter particles, yeah. for example, that we have never seen on Earth. We've never seen in the Large Hadron Collider and we're trying to figure out how to how to measure them on earth but we they're really really clear by their gravitational influence right, okay. when you're able to observe really big things over really big time scales you can see stuff that you just could never it, it just get in the large hadron collider yeah. and yeah because when you when you think about it even though it's a 27 kilometer around ring uh it is only a 27 kilometer around ring it's tiny yeah on, yeah. A, on like you know a much bigger planet that ha orbits a sun that has a nuclear furnace is going off in the center um which is just one of like 300 billion stars in our galaxy yeah. that has a supermassive black hole in the center which is one of 300 billion galaxies in the universe and um the observable oh, universe if anyone looked right now my eyes just rolled over <laughs> it's like oh my god <laughs> yeah and we've got exploding stars and anyway the the, the experiments that na nature does for us yeah. reach energy scales and time scales and length scales that we can't even hope to do with any of our earthbound experiments. Okay. So they're really complementary. We can we don't have any control yep. over those universal experiments yep. um, like we do over, the, we have very fine control over the Large Hadron Collider experiments. Mm. Um, but you can reach energies and do things that you can't do in the Large Hadron Collider. So they're really complementary. You need both to really understand um, fundamental physics. Is there anything in particular, because I believe a while ago I saw something that was... Um, that was documented on on the news or something. I don't know where I read this or saw it, but this is going back a little bit now. But they discovered a new a new particle mm -hmm. of some sort. Um, what's been the main sort of discoveries since they've had this this thing up and running? So the Higgs boson is probably the That's particle probably, that yeah. you're thinking of. That's it. Rings a bell. Very catchy name. Yeah. You know, the Higgs boson. <laughs> um, it's and the thing that I think is really really cool about this is that uh, we have our standard model model of particle physics yeah. and. Basically, it's describing all of the particles and how they arise using mathematics. Mm. Now, if we, we're in the situation where the mathematics said that if protons and electrons and quarks and things, all of these things exist, and they interact in the way we observe them to be interacting, then this other particle called the Higgs boson must exist. Mm. And it, in some ways, can be described as giving other particles their mass. Right. Um, so it was an essential part of the theory, and it was predicted 50 years before it was discovered. Right. So and I've got this theory, yeah. and then we need to put it into practice to try and make sure that the theory is correct. Yeah. It's taken that long to get that point. The, the way that you make, make it a, a theory really strong is you, you design your, your theory to explain what you've seen. Okay. But then, you know, if, you, if it's been designed to explain what you've already seen, it doesn't have that much explanatory power necessarily unless you can then also predict other things and say, well, if that's true, we yep. predict that this should also be true. Go out and try and measure that other thing. And if your prediction turns out to be correct, that gives you a lot of confidence that your theory is doing mm. the right thing. And uh, it's astonishing to me to think that we can use maths to predict the existence of a type of particle that we've never seen before and go out and actually be right. Wow. And it's happened more than once um, in the history of particle physics. Uh, and so how does that, so to com basically confirming a theory that was from 50 odd years ago, yeah. um, what impact has that had knowing this is true? How does that sort of fall into place with everything else that's been researched up until that point? Yeah, so the, the 50 years intervening has had lots of breakthroughs in different other particles that yep. have been discovered and that kind of thing. But... It, to be honest, it would have been much more exciting if we hadn't seen it. 
Yeah, right, okay. Because then we're like, ooh, something new. Because yeah. you're seeing it, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, we were right all along. But there's, we know that there are unanswered questions in physics, and yep. we're trying to desperately to let our, get our experiments to point us in the right direction where our theory can advance. And the thing that, that we're really struggling with is we've got – our theory of particle physics is based on quantum physics. Okay. We've got another theory which describes all of the gravitational interactions, and that's general relativity. Problem is, quantum physics and general relativity are fundamentally incompatible. Right. They can't both be true. There's an inconsistency between them. Yeah. Because in, in general relativity, time is malleable, you warp space right. and stuff. They contradict stuff. each other in a way. Yeah. And so we know that we haven't found the final theory that describes the world that we live in. So yeah. we're struggling to to come up with the theory that combines quantum physics and gravity. Mm. And so we're looking, there's ideas for how that can be done. Yep. Um, things like string theory are examples of um, trying to combine quantum, um, quantum physics and gravity. And it was also hoped that some of the predictions of string theory might have appeared in the Large Hadron Collider right. okay. um, or other theories. So there's an idea, for example, of um, supersymmetric particles where every particle has a, a heavier partner. And it was sort of expected that if that theory was true, you would have seen something in the Large Hadron Collider. But the fact that those types of particles were not seen mm. sort of – it's not, not a, the nail in the coffin for that theory, but it sort of lends um, – support away from some yep. of those theories so the problem is that we haven't actually seen that many other things in the large hadron collider we've we managed to rule out a whole bunch of theories that did predict things but we haven't found the positive result of a theory that you're like oh wow okay that's great if we'd seen supersymmetric particles we're like oh awesome this whole supersymmetry thing actually works and yep. we would have gone that way so we're trying to figure that out so part of um even not seeing certain things would probably tell probably just as much in some ways because you're still yeah. you're still proving something yeah. that something doesn't exist or hasn't come hasn't existed yet that yeah. you can find. So it's not always about what you can find, it's what you can't find either. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, who who shows up for your party and who doesn't show up. Oh, it tells, it tells, <laughs> tells a lot. <laughs> <laughs> who doesn't show up tells you just as much as who does show up, right? <laughs> um on on a high level looking at all of this because I guess the subject of mathematics and science, um, it, it takes a certain person to really, I guess, initially get the buzz to to show some interest and look into it further and then that become this passion and and a profession as well. Um, for, your, for your average Joe Blow that sits on the couch and watches reality TV and whatnot, mm -hmm. um, I mean, obviously pop culture's helped a lot in the last few years with making science a bit more popular and interesting and a lot more accessible. Mm -hmm. um, the work that you do, I guess, for somebody that from that world, what would be the benefits of, because of, um, you said right at the beginning of the more that we learn about what's beyond our planet, the more we can learn about what's happening here. Mm -hmm. So what's the practical, and uh, for lack of a better word, because I'm, I'm going to use the word practical, which yep. could be such an insult because like <laughs> everything I do is practical. But from a, from a layman's point of view, the, the practicality of a lot of this complex and really hard to understand research, what, yep. where, how does that transcend? Yeah. Well, I, there, I would like to say um, that the reason that we do this is, is, really, if I'm to be honest, curiosity. Mm. I, it's fascinating. And understanding our place in the universe and how the world works around us is just intrinsically interesting. Yep. Now, that doesn't convince a lot of people. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, we, and we wouldn't be given the funding that we're given for the yep. kind of stuff we do if it didn't have other practical outcomes. Yep. So one of the practical outcomes of the actual research itself is if we can understand something like dark energy, we've, it's got some sort of repulsive gravity, right? Mm. If we can learn how to harness that, maybe that's a new form of propulsion. Maybe that's yep. a clean form of energy um, generation. Maybe uh, we can do something with it that we haven't even thought of. Mm. But that's that's many years down the road, yep. not many years, de many decades down the road from mm. being able to understand that and turn that into something that we can harness. So the more immediate things that come out of this kind of research are the spin-offs of the technology that we um, build mm. and the... Um, 
the educational aspects why where people get interested in this like a lot of um people get into engineering and science because they're fascinated by questions like the like yeah. space and end up going out and doing many other things so a couple of the if you want concrete examples there's things like the um <laughs> you've the probably the most famous one which is probably a bit overused by now but the there were some astronomers at the radio telescope um, out at Parks. Yes. Who were looking for black holes. Okay. They were trying to find these black holes by rapidly varying radio signals. And you're like, this is zero practical application, right? Yep. Well, in order to find those rapidly varying radio signals, they had to develop algorithms to process radio signals really quickly. Right. And voila, they had the patent for Wi Fi. Huh. So, the, and that's quite practical. <laughs> that's been, that's something that the the people who are watching Netflix or whatever it that's happens it. to be might might actually be using. So, yeah. um, and yeah, there's a, I've got a friend who's gone from astrophysics to medical imaging and has actually okay. just designed using some of the adaptive optics type things that we use to make our images clear for astronomy. Mm. Found a way to make much much cheaper uh, what are they call MRI machines yep. and um, and it's done in a way that is um, much more cheaper, much cheaper and more portable. So it can be used um, for, mm. uh, well, and uh, different radiotherapy type solutions that can be used in um, so countries that don't necessarily have the budget for to be able to put um, really expensive pieces of equipment in Absolutely. many places, that kind of thing. Okay. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Yeah. So whenever someone's like, well, was, uh, especially when you hear like arguments about, taxpayer money and where yeah. money goes and, and allocating it to things that are priority. And, and yeah. so for people that just don't understand the link and where things can end yeah. up as a result of this complex and really for a lot of people just, it's so beyond their yeah. comprehension that it, that's where it begins with a lot of this stuff. But yeah. the, but the end result, I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's varied and, and yeah. yeah. Well, the uh, fast, one of the things that astronomy was really pioneers in were digital cameras. Yeah. Okay. Because in, you know, taking images on photographic plates and trying to analyze them is you just can't do some of the things with photographic plates that you can do with digital images yeah. with all the processing that we do to that. And I know some of the first supernova um, things, the supernovae were what was observed to discover dark energy. Yeah. Um, some of the first searches for supernovae were done with, I think it was like a nine pixel camera or something <laughs> like not nine megapixels, nine yeah. pixels. Yeah. Wow. And, <laughs> and uh, so they were real trailblazers in yeah. developing the technology and the, the telescope that we're using in Chile at the moment has a, um, a camera that took, the big one I was talking about before, it took 10 years to design and build. Mm -hmm. um, and th that's because we had to, to develop the technology to make the uh, silicon and make the actual um, digital camera detector, like at the very yeah, well. um, fundamental level. Yeah, but there, there's a really interesting study of the impact of the, um, the US space program, like, like the going to the moon um, uh, efforts back in the late sixties, early seventies, and the the splash on effect that mm. has had, and it was shown to have brought back into the U.S. economy eight times the amount of money that was spent from all sorts of different things, from including like the training of the engineers that went into it, mm. but also I mean like Teflon yeah. came from the space shuttles. The, the tiles that you need to re-enter the atmosphere and that's now on our frying pans yeah <laughs> and yeah things that you would just never think of um even like the sterilization of food like the like making food um safe and um yep. to transport and things so that there's less food poisoning was that was also an advancement from the shuttle program because they really really didn't want the astronauts to be getting salmonella while in space and it's incredible because if you look at it you know the the benefits of that and that's decades ago now mm -hmm. and the the exploration outside of our planet has been so limited in the last several decades for various mm -hmm. reasons but there's almost a a um there's no priority to pump a lot of money into this this part of of research to for mm -hmm. exploration and to to understand more of of what's beyond beyond this planet and the even if even if you just look at the financial benefits i mean yeah. there's obviously a massive outlay initially yeah. but the benefits are just incredible so it's amazing that just i mean i'm sure it's maybe it's moving in the in the right direction now but it just seems to have been fairly 
Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a bit of an alarming trend of requiring that all of the research has to have an immediate application Yeah, and industry partnerships. It's kind of things, human nature. Yeah, you must have show how this is practical. And that's all well and good, but there's uh, most of the really big projects that uh, come up with really f- massive breakthroughs that change technology are not things that can be achieved in like a three-year funding mm. window. Um, The telescopes that we're building that now, like as I said, that one took 10 years to design and build the camera. I'm working on um, some others where the lead time from envisioning it to creating, getting the first images with the telescope is like 25 years. Wow. Um, And that's just... So there's people who work their entire lives, essentially. I was going to say, it's their life's work just to create like this thing. Yeah. Wow. And it's... It, these are really difficult questions, but that 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 twenty five years you really push technology all the way to its limit mm. and um, have to trailblaze new things that no one's ever done before, which makes it really exciting, as well as difficult. Um, but it's how you make really big breakthroughs. I think it's a I think it's an amazing mindset to have and a, like a quality, and only certain people would really be able to harness this quality of being able to just have one relative focus and understand that this is this is me mm-hmm. you know yep. we're only here for a, a blink of an eye and for that entire blink this is all i'm going to be doing yep. and for some people i mean for me i'm i've never been diagnosed with, but i feel at times i've got adhd yeah. and i'm just i can't sit still and i always yeah. get distracted by things and um but and the thought of being able to just be focus on one thing and that's it and even knowing like for the next 20 years that's what it's going to be or my life's work is just that's terrifying for me (laughs) but obviously there's great qualities for somebody to be able to have that that vision and just stick to it yeah well the thing is that in practice on a day-to-day basis the kind of work you do as a researcher and doing um, and building these things is so wildly varied and interesting that you don't You've got this big aim in the future, yeah. but the day-to-day is actually really exciting and interesting. Enjoy the journey. Enjoy the journey. Yeah. I, I, I liken it a little bit to like playing a computer game yeah. where you know there might be some big monster you have to kill at the end, yeah. but the, the enjoyment of it is actually playing the game. Getting through all the levels. It's not and, actually yeah. – and, you know, occasionally you get, you'll pass a big level and you're like, yeah, that yeah. was great, and then you're on to the next one. Um, and, you know – you get to the monster eventually, yeah. <laughs> but it's the, the whole game that's fun. Yeah, I think it's, um, as you said, like little, like for you, little discoveries, little things that just yeah. uh, completely are unexpected along the way. That's yeah. probably the stuff is the fuel to keep you going because, yeah. I mean, what's for you, what's, what's your life's work as far as what's the, is there an end goal? Is there a vision of th- that one thing that I'm, I want to actually find out? I have no one specific question necessarily. Mm. Like, I mean, if we could answer the question, what is dark energy? Yeah. That would be, I'd be like, well, okay, yeah. good, done. But there's, I don't feel like we'll ever get to the point where we will have satisfied, uh, like, this is the final theory. Yeah. Like, there, every time anyone has attempted to say, we've almost solved physics, we're done, they've got egg on their face because a you know a few years later someone's found some some massive new discovery and probably and, um also discovering that something that has been uh put in theory is incorrect as well yeah because i guess a part of and i mean i've never been in science myself but um i assume that part of science is disproving as well as trying to prove an existing theory so yeah. there's constantly people that are looking for you know, ways, and it sounds so mean, but just to, to find ways of disproving things that are already out there in common yeah. knowledge. Yeah, well, it, that's how science advances exactly, in, in, essentially. The thing is that you're you're usually improving on something that was done before, and it's rare that you really find someone who that was, that was like completely wrong. Yeah. But you've, they've usually made approximations that don't work with the better data that we have now, or um, you, you're sort of you tend to incrementally advance on a lot of things. Just keep tweaking things. And, yeah. yeah. So it's a, occasionally you get a real big step change where yeah. something's like a major difference. But even if you look at like you had Newton's law of gravity, mm-hmm. if we go back to the gravity yeah. examples, and then you have Einstein's law, with it, which is general relativity. And that's quite a big jump in the sense that you in relativity – uh, or in in Newton's theory, space and time was just sort of a static background yep. on which everything else played a part. And then in relativity, 
space and time warp and bend and like you, what's considered simultaneous is different to yeah. different observers. You get things like length contraction, all mm. sorts of these weird properties. Uh, but the, but doesn't mean Newton's theory was wrong. It's just that it only applies in certain situations. When you are moving fast or have something really heavy, you need general relativity. But in all other situations, Newton's theory is still perfectly valid. It's just there's more there's more scenarios, there's more colour to to his yeah. ba basically what he's come up with is a basis, but then obviously it can extend or it, it does extend off that. Yeah, so the um, we still use Newton's theory to build bridges and yeah. skyscrapers. That we, mm. we there's no use using general relativity for those things. Very practical, <laughs> yes. But general relativity has much more explanatory power and. Um, explains some of the whys that yep. were just left as question marks in Newton's theory and um, works in every situation we've been able to test so far. So that includes the, the uh, I mean, one of the, the most common example where we need general relativity is for GPS. Yeah, okay. If we didn't get, didn't include the general relativistic details, we, because the satellite's moving fast and you've got um, things bouncing from a gravitational well, so like uh, f to yeah. the satellites and back to Earth, if you didn't get the timing right for that mm. in the general relativistic sense, your GPS would be off really quickly. So um, you're using general relativity every time that you use your, your um, maps. <laughs> Absolutely. We've done it several times today. <laughs> yeah. Um, so obviously with the, the rise of uh, science and pop culture, there's been a lot of movies that have come out over the years. And one movie that I, I don't know whether you've seen this, and if you haven't, then we won't, uh, we won't stick on it for too long. But have you seen Interstellar? I have seen Interstellar. Now, yeah, does, um, does Interstellar like really give you, is there any accuracy to it? Or is it a case of, um, I don't know, like I know with some people, they get really, really um, annoyed with, uh, I guess, the theatrics of, of Hollywood and whatnot. Is there certain things in this? I, I, and I looked at it and went, oh, this is really interesting. This is a different concept, especially when they're focusing a lot on gravity. And yeah. gravity seemed to be a big focus in this movie. And I just yeah. thought, oh, this is really interesting. But I thought, for someone that actually knows what they're talking about, is this BS? It's so funny. Some movies are, are um, do you, as long as, if the movie's really trying to be serious and mm. Um, and show a really like that they're really doing the science properly. Yeah. If they get that wrong, that pisses me off. But sometimes the movies are just being ridiculous and. and so it's already set the so, scene. There's a bit of context to begin with. It's like heads up, this yeah. movie's going to be ridiculous, and you're yeah. like, I can they're relax. Like, okay. Yeah. Uh, a movie like Gravity was an example where they got so much science wrong, but they tried to pretend to be really scientific. Yeah. That pissed me off. But Interstellar <laughs> was actually pretty good. Yeah. And um, the the concepts of the wormholes, the yeah. black holes, the time dilation, and things like that, they worked hard to get that right. And actually, one of the guys who they just announced the Nobel Prize um, for. 2017 that went to gravitational wave discoveries right. and one of the guys that won the Nobel Prize actually worked on Interstellar oh really okay um, because they the simul the visualizations that they did for Gargantua the really big black yep. hole uh, was actually a simulation a general relativistic simulation of how it actually would look <laughs> and they they amped it up a tiny bit for the movie mm. but basically that was um uh, the best simulation we had of what a disk of material falling into a black hole would look like. Um, and part of the reason is that is that, unfortunately, the, f the funding for movies is actually better than the funding for science. And so they and the supercomputers that they have to do their, um, their rendering uh, yep. are, are better than any that we have for astrophysics. So they, they were able to do a better job. They should have tagged on the... Yeah, they should, they should share those resources out a little bit, I think. Yeah, so they yeah. actually got a couple of published papers out of it. Yeah, incredible. Yeah, which is sort of cool. Well, I just remember watching it, and, and as I said, like, I know nothing about all this sort of stuff, and I watched, and I just, my I was on the edge of, and I don't, I don't watch a lot of movies these days, and I was on the edge of my couch just, like, going, oh, my God, like, I just couldn't keep my mouth closed. <laughs> and I'm like, this is, this is the most mine, like, I'm just, I'm on another... I felt like I was in another dimension myself, just trying to understand what was going on. And it was incredible. And I just thought um, it was an interesting take on, geez, like just the the relationship of gravity with everything that's mm -hmm. around us. And um, and I just thought, I just don't understand. I just don't know. This is so good and so mapped out that surely there's some 
there's some realism behind this somewhere. Yeah. So that's that's cool. I might actually yeah. go back and watch it now and feel a little bit more at ease going, oh, that's part yeah. of this is... Well, the, the differences in ageing that you get when you're yep. near a gravitational field like the black hole and, and the person orbiting in a spaceship far away, that, that is perfectly valid and, and, yeah. and true and all that kind of thing. But my take-home message that I had from Interstellar was... And this is probably a slight spoiler alert, but if you haven't seen it by yeah, now, spoiler, too late. <laughs> um, the uh, no matter how advanced your physics gets and your technology gets, it is very, very difficult to get to other planets, yeah. and they are almost guaranteed to be worse than Earth when you get there. Yeah, yeah. So we should look after this planet, right? And yeah. make, make sure that we that we take care of this one because it's. Nothing is as well suited to our type of life as Earth is. Well, from a Goldilocks point of view, that's what they—that's a reference that they use for mm -hmm. a planet that would be similar to us, or at least yeah. the the area of where we sit and the yeah. right elements and everything being there to make it that Goldilocks zone. Um, I think not like, too hot, not too cold. Yeah, just, just right. right. Exactly. Absolutely. So the next scenario that would be even close to us. I mean, what's the distance of of that next potential planet? I mean, it's it's something that would yeah. be hundreds of thousands of well years maybe I yeah the, so there's there's um so the nearest planets that we obviously would like to ha go and go and live on are things like mars mm. and the say not even not jupiter but the moons of jupiter yep that kind of thing so yeah we can inhabit our solar system first and then it's actually four light years to our nearest star okay um and they recently found some planets um around the the near, nearby stars and so it's actually not that far away there's yep. there are planets that are close to habitable zone planets within the, the sort of on the 10 light year away yep. um sort of range and that's still really really hard to get to mm. and i wish i had the numbers that i could remember exactly but the if you wanted to travel to those planets you can set off in a, um, a spaceship that accelerates at you know 1g so yep. same as earth gravity it accelerates gets halfway turns around and decelerates for the entire mm -hmm. time and you can uh, you can actually do that in a in a human lifetime you can you can get there and back in in um 20 years okay as seen by the person on board yeah um during which time and i can't remember the exact number but it's essentially tens of thousands of years will have passed on earth thanks to the magic of relativity Ooh. so wow if you did that 20 year trip everybody you know will have died not only that the civilizations you knew of will have died they'll Absolutely. uh there's going to be a completely different earth upon your return so the challenges of getting to other planets um that's without using a wormhole of course yeah. we don't know whether wormholes are actually possible but they're theoretically possible but if you just did a speed of light uh, as fast as you can not speed of light, but as accelerating as fast as you can and decelerating, um, you, yeah, you're in trouble if you're trying to do the return trip because the time dilation sort of kills you. I think you just uh, tie up all your loose ends or don't tie them up, who cares, yeah. and just uh, jet off and don't worry about it. Just yep. let, it, let it go. Just, yep. um, yeah, don't leave anything behind. But, um, yeah, wow, that's uh, that's incredible. And, and as you said, like even more of a reason to put a lot of effort into what we're doing here and making mm -hmm. sure that we're doing the right thing. Exactly. Absolutely. Um, okay. So before I wrap it up, um, and I mentioned this before, your website is really good. There's some great content <laughs> content you. on there. And I've read some of the research stuff that you've been involved with and you've got, oh, um, actually, I was going to ask you this, sorry, quite a slight tangent. The TEDx talks, there's two yeah. on there and they're yeah. from a few years ago, but yep. how did you get on the TEDx thing? I don't know that someone just contacted me and said, oh, "Hey, really? we're organising TEDx. Do you want to talk?" I was like, "Yeah, sure." Someone's on Google like me. <laughs> says, oh, yeah, you look, you look interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. And then obviously got invited back for the for another one. That was a yeah, couple of years later. Yeah, there was a, a different location, and yeah. I got invited to that. You can put applications in to give tech, TEDx talks, but okay. um, I was invited. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, did you see any results of doing the talks? Like, I mean, obviously on the day you've got the the response from the crowd and whatnot, but after that, moving forward, have you had people reach out to you? Have you seen an impact of having this this publicized talk very difficult to say there's yeah. like a, um i give uh, those talks were some of like a, a huge variety of talks yeah. and and i've def definitely been giving more and more talks in the in the last little while so and there's things like the world science festival which we have here in brisbane mm. where we get people from all over the world coming and give talks and, yeah. and there but it's um the thing i like about those kind of talks and and podcasts like this is probably mm. that you get to talk to all sorts of different people yeah. people who just not necessarily people who've come to listen to 
to science talks and uh, get because there's so much exciting science out there that I, I really would love everybody to know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's uh, I w- really wish that I could explain it in in more detail. I, I really I, it's hard to say because <laughs> I love it so much that I would like to be able to explain. Um, sort of in depth, but without studying it and, and things, there's it's only difficult. so much you can do. Well, I guess I guess the positive with it is that hopefully, through things like this and and these great YouTube videos of your TEDx talks and whatnot, that there'll be somebody out there that's on is in that moment in their life where they're about to make a decision as to when it comes to education and whatnot, mm-hmm. and they're they're looking at a number of different options, and then they listen to things like this or they watch something and go, "Hey, that's really cool. I might actually steer in that direction." Yeah. And so. Who knows, maybe in like 10 or 15 years time, you might have more people out there that can actually speak on that level with that yeah. detail as well. That's a, that's That would be really cool. And yeah. there's I've a couple of uh, instances of things like that I've experienced where I, I gave a, a graduation talk uh, cool. a little while ago and someone came up to me afterwards and said, I this is amazing that you're giving the graduation talk because I saw your talk a couple of years ago and it was your talk that inspired me to go do a master's in this subject. Perfect. And now you're here talking at my master's graduation. So you do That's see those cool. kind of things. That's so rewarding when you um, see that you've had that impact. Absolutely. Um, so you've been doing a bit of traveling recently. So, mm-hmm. um, and it's been a couple of years since some of these talks have been up. So what's I mean, obviously, as you said before, um, the the hunt for what dark energy is and whatnot will continue on yep. for the foreseeable future. But um, what what are you involved with right now, and what's what's on your plate? Yeah, so I've already mentioned the dark energy survey, which yep. is my primary focus at the moment. Yep. We we just released one of the most detailed ever maps of the distribution of dark matter in the universe, which wow. we made by at the moment is only twenty six million galaxies, not the three hundred million yet. But we were mapping the shapes of them, and by looking at the warping of the shapes. Um, because light gets bent yep. as it passes dark matter. You, you, we could t- detect the presence of the dark matter. Um, but we're going to use the same um, survey to m- map thousands of supernovae, measure the the ex- acceleration of the universe much more precisely and try and really map the uh, the details of how dark energy behaves and see if we can wow. figure out whether it changes with time, whether it's the same in all locations and that kind of thing. So we can narrow down what our theories are allowed to try and explain. Um, and so a lot of your traveling is around just having these discussions and doing this research with other people around yeah. the world? Yeah, because we've got groups all around the world. So yep. for the Dark Energy Survey, we meet up once every six months somewhere yep. in the world. Luckily, we're we're having a, a bunch of... Um, uh, the next dark energy survey meeting we're actually hosting here in Brisbane, so we're going to have about right. 100 astrophysicists from around the world converging on Brisbane for a for a week that's cool. to discuss these kind of things. Uh, and yeah, it's one of that's one of the real privileges of doing this kind of work is you get to work with um, some amazing, inspired, and inspirational people from uh, all around the world. And I guess one of the other benefits of astrophysics and research in general is just how how global it can be and when you look at um, countries that have conflict with each other they think one of the thing that always brings people together is working together for common goals Mm. and science does that in a a beautiful way i yeah spent a bunch of time working in copenhagen which was a a center of um, physics discovery and the sort of um, 20s 50s type um, regime when there was wars going on, but Copenhagen was a place where people from all sorts of different countries could still meet and talk. Seek physics. refuge and talk yeah. about uh, some more probably constructive, yeah. uh, constructive topics. Interesting. Yeah. Um, do you think that um, with many of us or the majority of the world's population living in cities and having light pollution, do you think that's a big factor where? so much of us are disconnected and we're stuck in these trivial human conflicts that we're not understanding what's sitting above us? Yeah, quite possibly. I mean, you look at all sorts of um, ancient cultures who had really strong histories about the the stars and stories about what was going on up there. One of the things I really like about the Aboriginal stories about space and and when they made um, stories up about the 
the goings on, the constellations, they often didn't use the stars themselves, but the the black p- patches. Yeah. They used the spaces between the stars, wow. the dark patches yeah. in the Milky Way, to make the the draw images. Like there's the big emu in the sky which goes across the Milky Way, and so the different. Um, you get different perspectives, which I, when I heard that, I thought that was um, absolutely amazing. Um, but I just think um, just the fact that you know, I live I live a couple of hours south of Sydney, and there's still light pollution down there, but it's nowhere near what it's like mm. when I was living in Sydney for for a decade, and or even living up in Brisbane. And um, you look up, and you just and it's this moment where you just you you completely it's this reality check where you sort of think whatever's going on in my head where I'm worried about a a phone call I've got to make or someone that I've had a bump in with that day or something that's coming up and I just look up and just go, my God, like I'm, I'm nothing like, but in, but in a really positive way, like I'm insignificant, but I am significant. That problem is insignificant. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just amazing. It's, It's incredible. And I think, I think if more people had the opportunity to really understand what was just above them. Yeah. There's, yeah. I had um, one of the travels that I did this year was I got to go to Easter Island, which oh, was cool. fantastic. There was a supernova conference there. Um, a bunch of the people who work in Chile at the telescopes, that's actually just a short flight for yeah. them to get to Easter Island. So we all went there and they've got those large stone heads yep. that, um, and a lot of, and when a lot of, there was a lot of the population uh, sort of died out on Easter Island, it wasn't... Um, sort of successful in in some ways but the mm. the thing that something really disturbed me when i went there was i always assumed that those heads were looking out to sea right but when you go the heads are all looking inland oh or the vast majority and what i what we discovered when we, um, we were given talks about what the history was and things is those were that the ancestors that were sort of protecting the villages yeah. and they were so they were facing in and looking at um, the village but for some reason that really disturbed me because I always thought they were looking out to sea looking out to beyond what we had and it seemed sort of uh, very insular to have them looking in mm. and I feel like us on earth are sometimes those people who are always just looking in and down at what's going on on, on earth and not looking out into space and I think sometimes that can be a dangerous perspective oh, absolutely I think that's I think that's a bit of food for thought. I yeah. like that. Uh, I think that's a great way to end this up. But thank you so much. Um, you're going to have to update that website. And, I will do um, my best. <laughs> <laughs> but um, even with what you've got on there is amazing. So I think there's going to be a lot of people that uh, really get a kick out of listening to this and and watching some of those videos. Um, you, you, I'm sure that uh, as you said, you, you love what you do and it's exciting. But I think uh, for a lot of people that don't know a lot about this, this is absolutely fascinating. So yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. If you want to reach out to Tamara and uh, check out any of the stuff that we spoke about in this episode, you can go over to the show notes at andysocial.net. I'm going to put the TEDx videos, um, some other content that uh, is up on her website, and um, lots of cool stuff that I've found on the internet about Tamara and her work. I'm going to put it all over at andysocial.net in the show notes for this particular episode. So please head on over there, check it out. And if you want to let Tamara know what you thought of the podcast, please uh, reach out to her and and let her know. All the details will be over there. AndySocial.net, AndySocial.net, AndySocial.net. How do you like that? All right, guys, uh, I'm going to wrap it up. The usual things, support this podcast, ratings, reviews, and all those different places, social media, fun stuff, sharing, and all that crap, and uh, and PayPal.me, Amazon portal links, and uh, new podcast coming along as well. Uh, I'm not sure when this episode is going to come out, but I've got a new podcast called Self Starter. That will be launched, if not already, but it will be coming very, very soon. I'll explain that more in an upcoming episode. I might even do a separate episode on the Andy Social podcast to do a bit of cross-promotion. Maybe some of you guys might be interested in that, but I'll leave that for a later date. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for listening, supporting the podcast, tuning in every week. If this is the first time, excuse a babble. I do that at times, but I really hope you enjoy the episode and stick around for the long term. Thanks, guys. Until next week. You're